Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. Mark and I are back with another show, and this week we talk about cognitive branding. If you haven't heard of it, make sure you tune in. We are joined by Sandeep Dayal, author of Branding Between the Ears, to discuss brain sciences and their importance on branding. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast, a place for business leaders to get the best and most credible information on marketing, strategy, and innovation. Your hosts, Mark Binkley and Vasily Sturos, share their experiences as they gather insights from the world's leading experts. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the show. Mark and I are excited to get a little geeky today and discuss cognitive branding. Now, because we couldn't do this ourselves, we brought on someone that can. His name is Sandeep Dayal. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Sandeep. Well, thank you for having me on The Sleeping Barber. Yeah, no, we're really excited. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. <laughs> this is going to yeah, be likewise. a great conversation. So for those that don't know, Sandeep is the Managing Director and Executive Vice President of Serenti. He's a keynote speaker and senior advisor to executives at various Fortune 500 companies. And before starting Serenti, he actually was working for McKinsey & Booz. Now, the reason he's on this podcast, though, is because of this book he recently authored called Branding Between the Years. And the book really does a great job outlining how to use some of that cognitive science and how brands can really kind of lean into that a lot more as they're trying to build some of those everlasting customer connections that we're constantly after. Now, when we're thinking about this and, you know, Mark and I were debating and brainstorming, like how to approach these, uh, this idea of how do we, uh, you know, take what we're learning from a cognitive science perspective, how does that actually interpret into branding? You know, we know that cognitive science was born out of this desire to really understand who we are um, as humans, the way we think, the way we behave. And because our learnings are constantly evolving, I think it's almost, it, it's a no brainer. How do we start bridging those gaps? So I think we would love to start really by you, you helping us define what is cognitive branding? Uh, certainly, and that's a great place to start at. Um, so I think, you know, if I just take a step back, what has been happening in the different sciences, if you will, is that there's a lot of thinking and a lot of advances that have come in about how the human brain actually works, right? So whether you're looking at uh, social psychology, whether you're looking at cognitive psychology, whether you're looking at behavioral science, uh, neuroscience, all of these different areas, the common thing has been that people are trying to get deeper and deeper into understanding how the human brain works. Mm -hmm. And that is creating, so I sort of coined this term brain sciences because there are just so many different pieces to put together, right? So everything goes under that big umbrella. <laughs> but the basic mm -hmm. idea, and this is not really new news, but the, the basic idea that reality as it exists, all reality, is essentially processed by our human brain, right? And it's very individual because everybody mm -hmm. perceives reality a little differently. And it is that idea that cognition of reality is what defines how we react to reality, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, mm -hmm. everything that happens is happening right between our ears and which is kind of what the title of uh, my book is uh, motivated by that it is, in fact, when we think about brands, everything that we see about brands, everything that we hear about brands, you know, the way it sits on the shelf, the way it's on a billboard, all of that ultimately is being processed by the human mind. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you take that whole area and start taking that lens onto it. How are people, how are consumers perceiving the brand? That is what becomes the cognitive science of branding or what mm -hmm. I call cognitive branding. The, the one thing that for me that pops out is like um, the idea of you hear this all the time and me and I've talked about it all the time or a bunch of times anyway, <laughs> but the idea that like we're all customer centric and then we kind of forget that well not forget, but maybe overlook that customers um, are people that have these giant brains inside of their bodies <laughs> that control a lot of their decision making. So it's really interesting in some ways that we're going towards these sciences and that you've, you've gone and investigated this too, um, to really try and understand customers, which I think is a great place to start because if we really truly are customer centric, then we have to figure out how we all think in order to think about how our customers think. Right. Right. Um, which is a fascinating kind of approach. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, 
sometimes the word customer centric, even though it's right on the money and very relevant, it's overused. You know, people mm -hmm. sort of say customer centric, customer centric, but people sometimes forget to think about what it really means. And there's a lot around this whole idea of getting into your customer's shoes mm -hmm. and being able mm -hmm. to look through their eyes, not yours, right? It mm -hmm. is that whole notion of understanding that the perception of a brand is very individualized and that you really need mm -hmm. to see this from their eyes to really understand how things are coming across because too often marketers make the mistake of seeing things from their own perception. Oh, this is how I'm designing the brand. So obviously everybody else sees the brand this way, mm -hmm. right? And then when yeah. it goes and hits the market, <laughs> they find that it's not at all how people see it. And then they have all kinds of crashes. So yeah. There are you know, several examples of that. Yeah. I mean, you hear about it all the time too. Like when it comes to any kind of testing, you're like, don't ever test it on yourself. Cause <laughs> like we're the weirdos that turn up the ads. We're the weirdos that like watch them on repeat and things like that. Uh, and most people don't behave that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of um, understanding how the brain works, I know you're talking about sort of brain science as a collective of things, and you've come up with a few different ways um, or, or um, functions of, of the brain, if I've got it right. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about that and and how they associate with branding. And, and they and I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, they're not. Like if you go in an anatomy textbook, these are not the things you see. It's more just like your interpretation of all these different sciences and how they work together. Right. Is that fair? Right. So, yeah. I mean, I think we always, or at least, you know, my background is as an engineer. So I always understand mm -hmm. things better if I understand the first principles, if I understand the fundamentals, and if I understand how those things are built up, right? Then you get a better understanding of those mm -hmm. things. So from that perspective alone, it can certainly be useful for people like me <laughs> to um, mm -hmm. to have some kind of a functional model of how the human brain works, right? And what is this difference that we're talking about? And from that perspective, mm -hmm. I give a stylized version of that uh, in my book. And earlier, I posited that, look, you have to understand how the human brain works before you can understand uh, branding itself, because that's where the brands are being processed. So then the question becomes, well, how does the human brain work? And there are a couple of different ways that it works. That it works. And then some of this work uh, or some of my understanding of this is inspired by Daniel Kahneman's work, right? I mean, he wrote the book, Thinking mm -hmm. Fast, Thinking Slow, which is very famous, in which he gave this whole yeah. idea of system one, system two. But right. if you get behind it, really what you're finding is that there are kind of two different ways in which the brain works when it has to make a choice particularly which is what we're interested in how do you make brand choices that the brain can work in two different ways one is more associative which is where the brain sort of works more instinctively and very quickly mm -hmm, by mm -hmm. relating things to other experiences that the brain has had right and we all have experiences throughout our lives you're going every day we're picking up thousands of experiences so <laughs> You know, yeah. just when you go on Netflix or you go on Amazon and, you know, they'll say, if you like this, you'll like that. Right. That is an associative way of thinking. And it's very different from someone sitting down with a spreadsheet and making decisions by, you know, calculating certain things and so on. Right. So most right. of the time, it's this associative brain, which in my book, I call the associator. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is one part of the brain. And. The mm -hmm. second way in which you do decisions is, and this is this is what happens when you run into a situation where you don't have any past learnings around, so in a new situation, or you run into a situation which is very risky so that you couldn't just, you know, make a simple rule like, hey, if I like this, I'll like that, you know, kind of because whatever, it's an expensive right. decision, it's a risky decision or what have you. So then you have to, in fact, sit down and calculate things out from first principles do the pros and cons from the first principles. And so that becomes the deliberator of the brain. But no matter which way we make choices, every time we make choices, we learn something. Mm -hmm. And we put those learnings for future use in our brain, and that's kind of the learner unit. So you have the associator, you've got the uh, deliberator, you've got the learner. And then there is what I call the coordinator, which simply comes from the observation and some of the work that has been done by uh, psychologists like Daisy and Ryan, who have really looked at what makes people take actions. You know, a lot of times we look at things and they make sense and 
we like things, but we don't always act on those things. So there mm -hmm. are cer certain things which motivate us to actually decide on even choices that we may have mentally made. And that's the piece that is sort of thought of as an inherent bias for action that a person has, which can be different from person to person. But nonetheless, it's kind of our tendency to take action on information that we have. And that's the conative piece. So if you take these three or four pieces together, it sort of are the building blocks for how our brain actually works, which is very different from saying, hey, there's a part in the brain that will process the emotion of love, or there is mm -hmm. a part of the brain that will do math. You know, these are kind of different things, but really mm -hmm. our brain uh, certainly, I believe, is set up in a way that there are networks and it's these networks that make things happen. So it's like, you know, all these parts are connected to each other and how those parts work together mm -hmm. is how things happen. Mm -hmm. And that is how brands are processed in that network, that neural net that sits inside our heads. That's really interesting stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to all this and deep and I'm trying to think, because I, I, I love the fact that the book didn't really get into the anatomy of the brain and whatnot, because I think I don't think I could have read it, to be honest with you. But, you know, breaking it down to these four elements, I thought it was really almost like a like an easier way to digest on how, you know, the brain operates and whatnot. But what I really enjoyed is that you went out and you actually, you know, you really talk about and start challenging some of those traditional branding models. Right. And because of this new way of thinking, so you call out things like the brand laddering and list branding as like, hey, you know what? These are probably a little more archaic. Marketers should probably shy away from them and kind of start thinking about it a lot differently. And um, I think it's just it's a different way of thinking. So first, I guess my first question here on this is like, do you mind briefly describing what you refer to as brand laddering and then also what is list branding? Sure. And and I should, you know, in all fairness, admit that. I practiced this branding and, uh, you know, and brand laddering and all of that for many, many years. You know, branding is what I do. So many, many years, that was kind of the way you did branding. Yeah. But then I was pushed mm -hmm. into a corner because we would do those things. We would use that in branding, but then find that we weren't having the impact that we wanted or we were mm -hmm. designing brands that looked like everybody else's brands. So, you know, it mm -hmm. wasn't working for me and which is kind of what set me on this path to cognitive mm -hmm. branding and trying to understand, hey, why is that not working? And the answer was, you got to mm -hmm. do something you know, different, better. Okay, so now just to take sort of uh, that step back and talk about list branding. List branding. So list branding is pretty simple in the sense that, you know, you have a product and it's around product differentiation versus brand differentiation. It's around, you take a look at your product, you say, hey, what are the things that are different about my products? I make a list of those things. And mm -hmm. then I say, hey, which of these three things are most important? And I'll make my brand about those three things that are important and different. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of list branding. The problem with list branding, and I'll come back to brand laddering in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with list branding is that the human brain is not designed to process lists. Right? So, yeah, and we all mm -hmm. experience this, you know your spouse, your wife, or somebody tells you, hey, go and buy these five things at the grocery store. And unless you write them down. I have one right? of those and things it's just not on long, my desk It's right not now. a long list, right? Five things. <laughs> then you go there and you go buy something and then you forget two of those and you buy two other things which are not on the list to begin with, right? And, and that's because we're just so difficult. It's just so difficult for us to process this. Our brain is not wired to process this. On the other mm -hmm. hand, you go watch a two-hour movie like I say in my book, for you go watch Forrest Gump and you come back and you can tell somebody that story. Yeah. And that was mm -hmm. two hours worth of remembering things. So you yeah. could remember two mm -hmm. hours worth of things, <laughs> but you couldn't remember five things, right? So mm -hmm. list branding is the same. And so, you know, marketers sometimes say, oh, you know what? I've articulated my differences and I've articulated the three important things. So I win. That's again, a marketer sitting at his desk and looking at things from mm -hmm. his own eyes. Whereas mm -hmm. the consumer's brain and even our own brain doesn't really work in that mm -hmm. same way. So list branding often fails because it's just not how the human brain processes and absorbs things. Second thing is around brand laddering. So this sort of comes from, and I would say Mark Govey started it originally when he wrote the book on uh, you know, emotional branding. And 
uh, essentially at that point, suddenly marketers realize that, look, if you put emotions around things, then mm -hmm. you people tend to you know, engage with those brands and brand messages better. And mm -hmm. so, you know, people started doing brand ladders, which is you figure out what those three things are that are different. So you're faster, you know, you have uh, greater convenience in your car or whatever, your car is quieter. And mm -hmm. you say, well, you know, what's the emotion that's associated with quiet? What's the emotion that's associated with fast? Mm -hmm. And then you started putting some emotions on it. But so this is like yeah. the starting with the functional and then getting into the right. emotional benefits so, that we all kind yeah, of Yeah, so there's yeah. a you know, there's a product feature which is the bottom rung, then you've got a functional benefit, which is rung two, then you've got right. emotion, which is rung three. Combine it all together in some clever way, and then that's kind of <laughs> functional and emotional branding ladder. And for mm -hmm. the longest time, marketers have done that. Even now, if you go to most places, that's what they use. But if you sort of go back and say what we said earlier, which is there isn't really a part of the brain which is you know just dedicated to love. There isn't a part of the brain which is just dedicated to anger, and so on. So you know what is what is going on? Why would this work? And there's just no evidence that something like that would work. What does work? I'm not saying that emotions don't work. Emotions actually can work really well, mm -hmm. but it has to in your brain associate it. It should associate with something else. Right. Something else that right. was a pleasant memory for you, something else that your learner unit in your brain said mm. is a good thing for you. So if those emotions are tied to those things, you know, so for example, if you are selling chocolate chip cookies and then people can associate the aroma of those chocolate chip cookies or their look to, you know, how their mother made those cookies at mm -hmm. home, then it's tied to a very specific memory, which many people might mm -hmm have it individually, but it's a shared mem kind of memory kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And in that case, if your brand did it very successfully, then the functional and emotional branding becomes very effective. But just mm -hmm. artificially it's tying funny. emotions mentioned... and functions together right. can do nothing. You mentioned the cookie thing. My dad used to actually have a couple of, um, a few different Ashley Furniture homes. Uh -huh. And they had Otis Spunkermeyer cookie Baker, you're in every store. I think that was the name of the brand, Otis Bunkermeyer or something like that. But so the idea was you walk into the store, you smell chocolate chip cookies, and it reminds you of like when you were a kid or whatever, and your mom or dad made cookies. So it feels homelier inside of the shop when you're inside of the stores. When you're buying furniture, it gives you these memories of amazing, you know, yes, time sitting around on a couch and you know spending time with family and so on and so forth. So the, right, so that's a great example, and that's the perfect cue for me to actually now go back to the first question you asked, which is, what is cognitive branding? So in my book, I define cognitive branding as something that is a key or a trigger for you to mm -hmm. recall some experiences that you already have. When I say you, I mean the consumer. So mm -hmm. it's a key that triggers mm -hmm. certain positive recalls of some cherished experiences that the customer already has or mm -hmm. a fantasy that they hired, that they harbor, you know, because that's when the brand actually relates to something and emotions and functions and all those things can get tied together in a neat little package. So cognitive brands mm -hmm. are the key to uncovering sensations that are right. tied to experiences your you know your most cherished experiences or your harbored fantasies that's what cognitive brands are i love what you just said there because you know you go on again into the book and you, you kind of articulate those three elements of cognitive brands and you mention you know vibe sense and and resolve as being like I don't know, call it the the secret sauce or like the, the magic that actually that's how you create those mind structures with brands is making sure that you are eliciting them. Um, I, I'm just curious, like, how did you come to those three things, those three elements? Right, right. So, you know, so at that time, so I'd been doing the list branding thing. I'd been doing the <laughs> brand laddering thing. And, you know, many times it wasn't working. And so you kind of, you know, always have to reflect back and sort of think about, hey, what's going on here? And in my book, I do describe one experience which sort of, you know, got me headed in this direction. Obviously, it's a number of things, but we were doing this focus group. And at that time, we were doing working on this drug called Humira, 
which is a drug which is used to treat people that have rheumatoid arthritis, which is a painful mm-hmm. joint disease, right? So you get stiffness, you get pain, and it's just a very, mm-hmm. it's a, you know, over your lifetime, it gets worse and worse. So it's a difficult disease. So we had got some patients, we had got Humira was just launched, had just launched, and we wanted it, the drug to do better, but it was a very different kind of a drug so that people were not initially open to accepting it that easily, including physicians for that matter, right? Because it was a very new kind of a biotechnology drug. It was one of the first. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing this focus group. I'm sitting with this woman talking to her and, you know, just trying to understand, uh, you know, just trying to explain to her that, look, here are all the great things about Humira. And, you know, why wouldn't you go ahead and try this drug? Because it's such a wonderful drug. And she looked at me for a while and then she said, look, Sandeep, Unless you understand what I'm going through, how are you going to help me? Mm -hmm. And it sort of made me stop and think. I said, you know, why does she want me to understand what she's going through? You know, I'm telling her this is a Mm -hmm. great drug. I've given her proof that it's a wonderful drug and it's going to, you know, it's going to make her life a lot better. What what does she care whether I understand what her life is like, right? But for Mm -hmm. her, that was very important. So you had to, as a marketer, sort of take instances like that and say, why is it that sometimes customers will not really accept your messages, will not have that credibility Mm -hmm. around your messages until you can sort of literally step in their shoes and understand what they're going through. Unless you can do that Mm -hmm. and unless you can communicate that, they won't believe you. They won't try your product, even if that product is going Mm -hmm. to be great for them. And... So that was a big learning for me because that's not what we were taught in school. In school, they didn't tell Mm -hmm. us that, hey, branding, make sure you understand what the person's life is like and what they're going through. You know, we didn't just tell them, you know, what you learned at school, just tell them it's a fast car. Just tell them it's a quiet car. (laughs) That's it. And they'll buy it, right? So that is where it sort of started opening this doors for me, where opening this door for me, which, which said, this is a bigger picture here. There's something else that's going on. And that is where I sort of started going into the direction of brand vibes, for example, which is one part of the three-part model, and start understanding concepts of brands with empathy, brands with values. What are these things which you were never taught about in school? Mm -hmm. I mean, the few things that popped in my head as you're describing that. First, um, I think that's just a really great example of doing market research uh, and how important it is to do that, whether it's, you know, mass studies or just one-on-one, you know, calls with, with potential prospects or candidates of the product you've got. I think that is valuable because you can, uh, you can say anything you want, but it doesn't mean you have a clear understanding of how, how the message is being received. So I think that's a really interesting thing. Uh, We also, we also had a, uh, former boss used to say, you can't be a good marketer if you just sit at your desk. Like you have to yes. go out and do that kind of stuff. Like you have to be in the field. You have to see how things are being done. You have to see the how consumers are using because often it's different than what yeah. you anticipate. How they would and, use you know, what you say makes so much sense, but I can tell you from personal experiences that most senior marketers don't do that hmm. these days anymore. You know, they hire people like well, me yeah. and they send us out you know, we do all the work. We sit in the focus groups, but those guys are too busy. So they'll they'll yeah. come for some of them, maybe. And I try to force them to come to some of these things. But mm-hmm. more often than not, they just look at a synthesized report. So then you're relying mm-hmm. on somebody else to give right. you some of these customer mm-hmm. insights, which is okay, but you need to be out in front. You're a marketer. Experience you it. need to be yeah. out in front of your customers often and really listen to them. There's really no substitute for that, I would say. Mm-hmm. The other thing I had about, I mean, you talk about vibes and and the other two elements I think that you had um, outlined in the book were uh, sense and resolve. When I was looking through that, I, there's a couple of associations that I was making. And and I don't know if they're, if you meant them to be similar or if I'm just interpreting them to be similar, but it's kind of like, consumer trust, consumer confidence, and consumer satisfaction in a way is the way I was reading those. Like, 
different words, but I think the way you're defining them were similar kind of concepts and ideas in order to be able to have a good product or a good branding strategy, you had to address those three issues. Is, is that a fair assessment? So or you said consumer kind of trust, and what things? was the middle one you said between confidence and trust? Consumer confidence for sense and then consumer satisfaction for results. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think these are things that can have some relations. Obviously, these concepts are pretty big. So, you know, trust is a part of um, uh, what you could call brand vibes. But I do mm -hmm. like to make the distinction because I think the, the challenge can be if you take things which are somewhat similar but not exactly similar, you can lose mm -hmm. some of the value of the thinking there. So in, in mm -hmm. the case of brand vibes, I very specifically, rather than talking about just trust, I very specifically talk about the notion of empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. trust can mean a lot of things, right? right. So I talk specifically about empathy as in having that a brand having a social chemistry, if you will, between the consumer and the brand, you know, having that connection. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk specifically about values. Values are a sense of what is right and wrong, right? How we mm -hmm. judge right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And when brands decide, and they don't always have to, but when they decide to associate themselves with what the consumers sense of right and wrong is, then they become brand, they become brands with, brands with values. So Humera example that I gave you where Lisa was telling me to really understand how she felt and communicate that. Mm -hmm. For that, we had to design what is called a brand with empathy in all our communication mm -hmm. messaging. As far as brands with values, that's brands like Ben & Jerry's, like Patagonia, mm -hmm. you know, that take a specific stance against what they feel is right and wrong, which is driven off the consumers that they serve. And not everybody agrees with them, mm -hmm. by the way, but that's what they do. So these are very specific things. Now, both of those things, empathy and values alignment, may lead to trust and a very, mm -hmm. very hardcore trust for that matter. But understanding which direction you're going in, are you going in the empathy dimension? Are you going in the values dimension? Those things have very specific implications if you are sitting and designing brands, if you're sitting there and designing your brand strategy, because those are choices you have to make. Hmm. Love that. Um, shifting gears here now, I kind of want to get it into get into the, the topic of really like building a brand with purpose, because you really do, a, in my opinion, you do a really great job kind of articulating this. And you really outlined three three ways, if you will, to build a purpose around your brand. You, you mentioned support what your brand is about, do what your consumer can't, and be authentic. Now, this, in, in our minds, kind of brought up another, another idea uh, here, because you also go into the nuance of talking about how marketers should treat strategy and execution as one in the same, which is also like, you know, immediately I had to read, read that sentence. I'm like, what, what, what is he actually saying here? But it brings up the debate. You know, it's similar to the notion of like, whether the media informs the message or the message is the media. And I would just love it if you can, you can uh, elaborate a little bit on why strategy and execution are, should be treated as one. Sure. You know, one of the things that I help, um, that I find helpful for me personally is that I tend to think of brands uh, as persons, you know, it's my relationships mm -hmm. with people. And Brand relationships tend to behave like people relationships, mm -hmm. which is why people get so upset when their brands do things that they didn't expect those brands to do, right? Yeah. So it's kind of that relationship hmm. um, is a very strong thing. So if you take it from that perspective and you take a step back, you know, and if you look at the relationship that you might have with your friends or the relationship that you might have with your children or your spouse, mm -hmm. you already know that's not being right is not everything, right? <laughs> How you say things matters a lot, right? Mm -hmm. we, know, we know from those relationships that's true. With your children, if you were trying to get them to do something that you wanted them to do and they weren't agreeable, how you say it to them matters just as much as whether what you said, the substance of what you said was mm -hmm. right or wrong, right? right? In the same way, with brands also, you have to understand that piece, which is how the brand says certain things is inseparable from what the brand is saying. 
you know, what the brand is saying mm -hmm. is about, you know, could potentially be about the functional benefits, you know, what is right, what is wrong and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But how it says is it's very important. Otherwise, consumers can turn away uh, from those particular brands. And in the book, I talk about, for example, you know, political branding, where you had uh, at that time Clinton and Trump uh, in the game. I think that was a 2016 election. And mm -hmm. when they were talking about immigration, for example, Hillary Clinton's view of it was, hey, you're going to get all this talent in and you're going to get all these great people in. We're going to get more diversity. We're going to be living to the values of a, you know, free America and this and that. So it was kind of that whole idea of this amplifying your pleasure and making it about that great shining city on the hill. Whereas when Trump mm -hmm. talked about it, he talked about in what you stood to lose. You know, if immigration mm -hmm. happens, people are going to, you're going to lose your job. It's because it's something that you have that's going to be taken away. And what we understand mm -hmm. from psychology is that loss aversion is a big thing. You know, it's it's the thing that yeah, it's more powerful. It's more powerful. Than gains of equivalent size exactly yeah. than gains of so mm -hmm. the shining city on the hill versus you're going to lose what you have. You're going to lose what you have wins. And basically, Kahneman. And Tversky showed that with their prospect theory and they won a Nobel Prize for something like that. So how you say these things matters a lot, even if you're talking about the same thing, so to speak. And that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's so many things that are rolling in my head as we're talking about this. And it, to be totally honest with you, like it, it's challenging the way I, th you're challenging the way I'm thinking about things. <laughs> Um, in, in a lot of good ways, cause it's making me gut check what I have believed to be true so far. And I'm also like you, there's a lot of things yeah. I think are junk, like SWOT analysis to start. <laughs> sure. Uh, like the brand ladder, I, I struggle yeah. with a lot too. Uh, the cognitive brands, I'm making associations between a lot of the work that you've uh, talked about here and then the work with with like Ehrenberg Bass and the things they've published the B2B Institute which is a lot of Aaron Bass stuff um, the Kahneman Tversky stuff like there's lots of really good stuff here the one part about purpose I'm really struggling with is purpose because there's also a lot of evidence that says it doesn't matter it actually doesn't help brands very much at all and a lot of marketers uh, I think have destroyed purpose the term at least just like we have you know with being green and uh and esg and like we latch on to stuff and then we kill it because mm -hmm. <laughs> we just f really bastardize what the original intent was for it for our own purposes so that we can fit in with the current trend i think you know what yeah. i mean i'm loving myself in the same category <laughs> but but purpose is it is really challenging in that I just don't know where I sit on purpose. Like I think sometimes it matters and another like Ben and Jerry, sure. And, and Patagonia, sure. But in their case, like to the core, they are built for purpose. Whereas a lot of think the other times it's like just lipstick on a yeah, pig. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, that's great. And which is why I think what I've done in the book is I've tried to simplify things. I mean, I, and to be honest, we're yeah. talking about things that are pretty complicated. <laughs> But, you know, com <laughs> complicated, complicated doesn't yeah. work, right? I mean, that's not how you can make things practical. But nonetheless, like in, yeah. for brands with purpose, we talk about these three things, which is mm -hmm. um, that it must be on brand, which is it must be mm -hmm. fitting with your overall brand strategy. Don't just put lipstick mm -hmm. on a pig kind of a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, I, uh, you know, so for example, a lot of brands do, hey, you know, if you buy my thing, I'll give a dollar to whatever this children's charity. Yeah. Okay, sure. well, you know, you're, share, you're, se you're selling a shaving cream. What's that got to do with children's charity, right? I mean, so it's like, yeah, that's not on brand. So right. A, thing mm -hmm. has to relate to what your brand strategy is. That's point number one. Mm -hmm. Point number two, as, uh, as I mentioned, there is, it should be something that you can do better. You as the brand and the company that are you that you are can do better than I could do on my own. You know, if I wanted to give a dollar mm -hmm. to a charity, which is for children, I can do it myself. Why do I need to give you mm -hmm. a dollar and then yeah. you send the dollar there, right? So mm -hmm. it's better if you get into something 
that you are really good at, that you would do better, then I'm happy to give you that dollar, right? So I think that that makes mm-hmm. uh, that mm-hmm. makes uh, the other thing. So all birds does that. So mm-hmm. they, you know, they're into these environmental causes, but they've set up a lot of research capabilities to make their shoes, you know, to make whatever shoelaces out of pine trees or eucalyptus trees and so on. You know, you and I could mm-hmm. do that. But they can because yeah. they're putting the millions of dollars. So I'm happy to give them that dollar extra or whatever that 10% mm-hmm. extra or whatever that might be. And then it has to be authentic. It, you know, it just can't be things that, oh, I, geez, everybody's doing brands with purpose. I better do something about my brand and put a purpose around it, right? right. That doesn't mm-hmm. work. The, the, you have to... Now, not every brand needs to be a brand with purpose, by the way. But right. if you can, if it does strategically fit with what you're doing, then it can work really well because, you know, let's get in the real world. The real world is very competitive. You know, Mm -hmm. if you're selling soap, like Dove soap, for example, yeah, Mm -hmm. you might have a soap that cleans well, that is, uh, you know, it's a good cleanser, it's a good moisturizer and all that. But so are 20 other soaps. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, your purpose is to clean. Yeah, you, your purpose is to clean. And, and, and really, no matter... <laughs> make me smell, smell good. good. <laughs> Wash the dirt yeah, away. And no, yeah. But no matter what you do, there are lots of other soaps which are indistinguishably as good. Yeah. So in those situations, if you can find a way to insert purpose into your brand, it gives you a whole different dimension, an added dimension which others couldn't replicate. So for example, right. if you're Dove Soap, and you tie yourself to whatever that is, you know, around clean hands and real and beauty. beauty and oh. all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, the other guy can't come here and say, oh, I'm also about real beauty. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That's a much harder thing. Once somebody has claimed those particular purposes, it's very hard for the competitor also. to. So that's why if you can find purpose and you believe in it, it's real mm-hmm. and it fits with your brand, it can do wonders for your brand. But it's not always possible. So, Don't force it. Yeah. The real beauty one is an interesting example because just kind of threading back in the conversation to when you were talking about association, I don't know when they started, but I remember seeing this back, I want to say, like, I think I was, I, I used to teach social media in like, yeah, that was like I think it was almost 15 2013. years back. Yeah. So I feel like I remember seeing some of the commercials yeah. back then because I used some of them as examples. And at the time, it was radical because they were using normal looking people. Mm-hmm. And that's the whole yes. point of the Real Beauty campaign, not like tiny stick yes. models, yes. right? And that you see most of the time. So at the time, it was very radical, relatively speaking, to show real people in ads. And, and, and they stuck with it. And I think what's happened is that they built associations between real people with real beauty. And now I've seen... Uh, Victoria's Secret has jumped on that bandwagon where they're they're sh- using real people as their models now. But now I'm kind of confused about whether Victoria's Secret is advertising for Dove or if it's <laughs> like Dove's advertising. You know what I mean, it's so the, I think that is a strategic advantage for them if I'm picking up on what you're saying about purpose, where they've embedded it as a part of their competitive mode. Um, and they can defend it because they started early and they stuck with and people it. people remember. And it's not a trend. Yes. And people now are remembering, they're associating with Dove yeah. with real beauty and, and all that. And now anyone that copies that is a probably associating their, whatever that product is, like Victoria's Secret, with like real models, but now also real models to Dove. So it actually helps Dove in some ways, probably. Yeah, it does. And I think the real beauty campaign was also one of the things that got it, got me started in this particular direction, because, mm-hmm. you know, just to add a add a few more layers to what you just said, when the Real Beauty campaign came out, that their insight basically was that when women saw all these anorexic, perfect models on TV and Mm -hmm. on these billboards and so on, right? It actually made them feel worse about their bodies. Yeah. Because they'd look at these Mm -hmm. models, they'd say like, I'm never going to be like that, right? So they weren't Mm -hmm. feeling better. They weren't looking at these models and saying, oh, I'm going to use the soap and become like that. No, they were looking at them and saying, I'm never going to be like that. So it was making mm-hmm. them feel worse and more shame about their body. Right. So when they came out with this real beauty campaign and they put these billboards everywhere with women that were more like normal women, you know, women that could be our sisters, our mothers, our 
colleagues at work that put those kinds of women on the billboards, it was like people could say, yeah, these guys understand what I'm going through, how those other right. brands are actually shaming. Mm -hmm. So it was that sense mm -hmm. of empathy which they, which they created. And mind you, many of those billboards in, uh, that were spread out all over the, uh, you know, all over the country, and in fact, in many different countries, that campaign was successful mm -hmm. all over the world. Right. Had no mention of the soap. Yeah. It just said Dove, and it showed mm -hmm. all these women. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. and it said real beauty. Yeah. But there were it never did it say, never did it say our soap um, is the best cleanser. Our soap is the best moisturizer. Even though they had those credentials, yeah. they never mentioned mm -hmm. those things. They just talked about real beauty. So they, in fact, because if they had just talked about, hey, we have uh, every bar of soap contains, you know, 50% cream. Well, I mean, what stops the next guy from coming up with 60% cream? Totally. Nothing. Yeah. Right. Well, yours is not good because I have 75% yeah. <laughs> cream in my bar. List branding. Exactly. There it is. <laughs> And that's yeah. easy for anybody else to do also. But once they claimed real beauty, they owned it and they, they still own it. it. Yeah. You know, I, I absolutely love this conversation because, Mark, you would have remembered this. So Sandeep's just some background. Mark and I worked in a previous life together in the retail industry. And we were going through at that time kind of like this brand exercise. What do we stand for and whatnot? And like many companies, you look at the big brands and you kind of create like this aspiration. Oh, we need to be like Nike. We need to be like Apple. We need to be all these things. And at that time, the brand strategist told us, because like this was essentially like a house of brands. So it was like a, a yeah. Dick's sports uh, retailer, right? So right. what is Dick's? It's really, it, it's nothing. It's just a whole bunch of brands together. So mm -hmm. in, in the case in the, in the Canadian company here, similar model, if you will, told it basically said that it's okay to embrace who you are and you are a house of brands. You may not mm -hmm. need to elicit that same emotion that Nike does. Nike's mm -hmm. doing that for mm -hmm. you. All you should really re be caring about is that you have that product in your store. Mm -hmm. And how do you create some of those mm -hmm. associations? So mm -hmm. I love what you're talking about. It's like not every brand has a purpose. Yeah. Some are just a mm -hmm. big box retailer. And your yeah. purpose is to provide the product at the best price possible. Simple. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and I think some brands are still under, even Unilever, which had Dove which has Dove, uh, they have gone mm -hmm. through that uh, struggle because uh, the CEO announced that they were going to, you know, he was going to, every brand was going to have a purpose or it was going to be out. Mm. And Unilever's share hasn't been, share prices haven't been doing that well, relatively speaking. So they've been under a lot mm. of pressure that, hey, what's this purpose business, you know, get us some real returns. And in fact, mm -hmm. even as we speak, they're undergoing a, a CEO change mm. and they're going to have a new CEO. But nonetheless, that is where these three principles that we just talked about, hey, is it on brand? You know, right. is mm -hmm. it authentic? You know, is it something that you can do better than anybody else? If you can answer those three questions positively, then you've got a brand that can be a brand with purpose. If you can't answer mm -hmm. those three questions positively, then don't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So interesting. <laughs> I remember yeah. that too, V. <laughs> And the other thing, like, yeah, the other just, point that I would just yeah, like to yeah. emphasize, just going back to that whole idea of list branding. Remember, this whole real beauty campaign managed, you know, you wouldn't think of the real beauty campaign if you just started with list branding, because then you would say, hey, it's got to be about the cleansing capability. It's got to be about the, the creaminess right. of the soap, because those are the things on the list. Real right. beauty is not on the yeah. list. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's what sort of forces you to ultimately and you when you get into the practical side of branding you really find that the truly iconic brands have managed to crack the cognitive branding not not just those other things that we talk about some of that of that i think comes back to positioning too like the the brand ladder gets you one direction but the real beauty gets you in a different direction like i gotta imagine in order for them the marketers there or whoever it was to get to the idea of real yeah. beauty, they must have done what you were talking about before, which is the empathy part, sitting down with yes. customers and figuring out what really mattered. Cause otherwise you go FOMO, we have 98% cream. 
cream yeah. and like don't <laughs> miss out on our on our 98 percent. you can't nobody else can get because otherwise it would just be cream <laughs> we have soap that is now <laughs> exactly but it's still, very soon you're just selling so, cream like, not a soap yeah yeah so but i imagine like that is they had to have started yeah. at, at that no they did they, from, from it sitting came with from customers. customer insights you know where they where they actually the as they got into those conversations with customers, they learned mm -hmm. that, in fact, many of these brands, which were cosmetic brands, beauty brands, were shaming, you know, making customers feel ashamed of their own bodies. Inadequate. Yeah. yeah, they weren't making them. And once they got that insight, then they started working on, well, how do we, what do we do? How do we work on that? Yeah. There's one other thing that I, I kind of stumbled across. Um, I can't remember where it was in the book exactly, but talking about moments um, and and sort of branding moments as well, I, I, I thought that was so fascinating um, because a customer goes through all these different experiences, and there's moments throughout their their uh, purchase phase, or the you know, if you want, depending on the model you're thinking of, like a consumer decision journey or the ADA funnel or whatever. But then there's also the post purchase experience, and so there's moments all around there that brands can have an influence on. And, and, and I know you talked about uh, climax moments. Yeah. Can you tell me more about that and thinking about that as a brand and, and some of the work maybe if you've got any examples that um, articulate that point? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, so uh, as I mentioned before, what happens is that as we go through life, our senses, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's our eyes, whether it's our nose, whether it's our sense of taste, what we're hearing, we're, we're observing things and all of these experiences are going to sort of getting wired into us constantly through all our senses, right? Mm -hmm. And this is happening every second of the day that we are alive and conscious and doing things, right? Mm -hmm. So the human body obviously is not, the human brain is not obviously, you know, processing every second. The human brain finds a way to just understand which moments are important, which moments are not important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as a brand marketer, yes, your brand has a moment every second. There is something or the other happening. But which of those moments really matter? And how right. is the brain mm -hmm. doing that sorting? That's the question that you have to ask. Well, once you ask that question, <clears throat> there are answers that are coming from the work that Kahneman has done and uh, the work that some other uh, psychologists have done. So Kahneman talks about the peak end rule. So in his research, as he, as he processed and he uh, studied experiences, he said that what people really remember, so you know, you go for a, whatever, you know, the examples that he gives, or you go for a three month holiday, or let's say even a one week holiday, mm -hmm. you don't remember every moment of that holiday. What you remember, mm -hmm. he says, is the climax, that's the peak, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how that tail end of the holiday was, you know, how it finished. Mm -hmm. So it's the peak and the end that you remember. And that is what, in fact, defines your entire experience. Right. So that mm -hmm. becomes something that you start using and branding. And I give examples in my book around, uh, you know, my flight experience. But I'll give you another example, which, which is not in the book, but just uh, is interesting anyways. Uh, but which is when you go to a, uh, go to a restaurant, right? And mm -hmm. you have a waiter that is serving you there. And these waiters have fi you know, figured out what Kahneman figured out without reading his book. You know, they figured out that peak mm -hmm. and the end remember. So that is why when you go into a restaurant, one of the things that a good waiter will always do is that they'll come to you and they'll ask you, sir, how was this special? You know, because if you mm -hmm. ordered the special and you ordered mm -hmm. it, or how was your main, main dish? Because that is the main item of the, you know, that's the highlight of the meal, right, the main right. meal that you're having. Right. So they want to make sure and come and ask, if they come and ask you about that, they're reinforcing in your mind, mm -hmm. you know, the best part of your meal experience. Right. Mm -hmm. And second thing is that yeah. one of the other things that people do is like, you know, when you get your check, sometimes you will see and it'll say, uh, thank you, Mark, because they got your name from your credit mm -hmm. card. They'll say, thank you, Mark. Yeah. And they draw a smiley face. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, yeah. So now you're seeing how your meal ended. And those two points mm -hmm. define very much your experience. And now I'm saying this, but there are people that have done studies on this. 
And what they were looking at was mm -hmm. when these things happen, what happens to tips? So mm -hmm. when people, you know, drew that smiley face and said, thank you, Mark, the tips were 14% higher. You know, mm -hmm. when they came and asked about how the main dish was, then yeah. that drove higher tips and so on. So mm. there have been studies that have been done in all kinds of shapes and sizes, which where this gets important. Yeah. Now, this is a matter not of so much of brand strategy, but more of the brand execution. So this is where you get into the how. Right. Of the experience. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you're going to deliver yeah. your brand experience, when you go to Starbucks, that is where you're going to experience the brand once it's been positioned. So there, mm -hmm. you got to make sure for each person walking walking in, how that peak and end is going to look like, because that's going to define the experience more than anything else. And that's mm -hmm. why when you go to hotels and you have a stay, if they do something that was different, something that was really exceptional, you tend to remember that. Mm -hmm. It can work the other way also. Mm -hmm. If they do something, they really screw up, then yeah. you just remember that, yeah. right? So those types yeah. of things define then the entire experience and you forget everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. V, I, so um, Sandeep, you don't know this, but V is Greek and his his family has uh, has been in the restaurant industry. <laughs> okay. I think Greeks might have invented the whole like peak <laughs> yeah. moment thing with Saganaki. <laughs> like, oh, oh, and the flame, like... <laughs> You designed an experience <laughs> specifically yeah. to create a peak moment, like a flame. You know, yeah, like that's yeah. exciting. It is. I mean, the first, like everybody gets pumped up. I mean, the first time I went to a place. Greek restaurant, I was like totally taken by that. It's like, whoa, what's that? And then, you know, and then every time I go, I order that. And you expect it actually yeah. too. So even if you're in another restaurant, you you're looking for who ordered the saganaki, so you can see the flame come up. Exactly. Totally. Exactly. exactly. But it's 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 an interesting like that's, I love that example. Such an interesting thing. It's a source of inspiration yeah. too, because you can, like, we all have restaurants around. You could go around and just see what kinds of moments they've created, or either or like supported for a peak mm -hmm. moment and an end yeah. moment. And to that point, we were we just went to the states um, just this past weekend, and the weirdest thing happened at one place. They took my credit card at the end of the meal. And I was like taken aback by that because <laughs> here where I am right now, everybody shows up with their machine yeah, yeah, and they're right. like, you pay at the, at the yeah. counter or they, you pay at the table, right. but it created this weird like feeling in my head. What? Like it was a good meal yeah. up. And then I was left with this, like, well, what's oh, going that's on? Weird. Where, like, Why are you taking my card? My card? <laughs> yeah. Right. And I think that is, uh, it's funny. And that's the <clears> other thing that uh, that is also around brand experiences in terms of what moments matter and what kinds of moments you can create. There's right. a lot of discussion, as you know, these days around surprise and delight moments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the surprise piece is a is an important thing. You know, you shouldn't have unexpected surprises which are bad or they can create create <laughs> yeah. anxiety in somebody's mind. But, Taking Mark's you know, card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you should have surprise moments which. Uh, you know, which you didn't expect because like I said, yeah. what the brain does because it's getting so much information. If you do what your customers yeah. expect, they're actually not going to notice things. You know, people in marketing talk about, hey, yeah. you know, meet customer expectations. The reality is if you meet customer expectations, they're just going to glaze over it because that's what they expected. You did that. They're not going to really focus on it. Right. But mm -hmm. if you architect a moment that is special, that is different, that they didn't expect, even if it was a small thing, even if it was a really small thing, you'll remember it. Like I was talking to, uh, talking to another friend of mine, and he said that, you know, look, one time he was um, at the Ritz, I think that's where he was, and he was um, reading a book. And, when the, uh, and he had uh, just placed, like, inside the book, he had placed, like, uh, you know, just some, you know, like a wire that he had sitting there just to mark his place mm -hmm. in the book. And in fact, when the cleaning staff came, they took that wire out and put it nice and neatly. And in the book, at that place, they put a Ritz uh, place marker, uh, you know, and then mm. just left it. So it's just a little thing. But he mm -hmm. noticed it because he didn't expect that to happen. Mm -hmm. And it didn't right. cost them anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you just put a bookmark there, which is your branded bookmark. And you mark his place in the book and leave the book alone. But he, it made him remember that and it made him talk about that versus the 30 other things that Ritz must have done when he was right. staying there. Yeah. Although I think you like the credit card example thing, just coming back yeah. to that and comparing that to the, uh, the Ritz card example, I think a brand can create an expectation and that's what people want, right? Like 
that's why you go there. Like I go to McDonald's, not for any surprises because I don't want any surprises. I just need fast food because my kids are freaking yeah. out in the back of the car or whatever the thing is, right? And they really wanted a burger and there's nothing else around. Right. And so, but th- so if you create an, an unexpected surprise in a negative yes. sense that has a downside to me because you wanted to give me a free slushy or something yeah. or whatever, and it's taken an extra 10 minutes to do it, then that's right. damaging right. to the brand. Whereas the the example of taking the car, uh, the cord out and putting in the Ritz Carlton right. thing, like that, there's no damage to that. And right. was, so that's pleasant because right. now I can use my, I can charge my phone, charge my phone instead of <laughs> using it as a. Yeah, yeah, no, but I think um, it, it's you know. So obviously, these things uh, you have to look for. But even with small things, even with a, in the case of McDonald's and so on, you you don't have to do it every time. So what you do have yeah, to do right. is you gotta meet people's expectations. Yeah, but you can mm-hmm. train people to look for those moments where something happens and where you can do something that's a little little different you know mm-hmm. even yeah. whether you whether you, you know whether a mother is going in there with her with her mm-hmm. child and somebody just said oh yeah i'll just watch him i know you're going to the bathroom and i'll just watch him for, for you for the second you know just a little something like that might be something that she remembers right so it's mm-hmm. uh and and certainly the better brands like starbucks uh certainly these luxury brands and so on they train <clears> their <throat> people because this is hard to do they train their totally. people to look mm-hmm. for these moments totally. you know yeah. And then they execute them. And when everything comes together, it works really well. Awesome. You know, it, yeah. there's one thing, you know, I know we're, we've taken up quite a bit of your time today, but we, I did really want to touch on ethics a little bit uh, because I, it's truly important. And I love the fact that you actually had a chapter in the book that talked about this. And, you know, I think as, as a, I guess maybe my question is to you, what is that responsibility that we continue to have as marketers, especially as the sciences continue to evolve, the understanding of human behavior continues to evolve. I think we have to be careful with a lot of this information that we're becoming very, very privy to um, because it can be used potentially maliciously. So what in, what in your mind really stands out when you think about ethics and, and maybe even leveraging cognitive branding? Right. So in, as far as ethics is concerned, I think the first part of what you said is very important, which is that we as marketers have to take on that responsibility proactively. Mm-hmm. Because, and why is that? Because as our understanding of the human brain becomes more and more precise, there is a possibility that you can manipulate right. uh, uh, consumers. Mm-hmm. And when I say manipulate, meaning you may manipulate them to do things which are not really in their interest. They're in your interest, but they're not in their interest. Mm -hmm. And so who's going to be, you know, who's going to take responsibility for that? I think that marketers have to take that responsibility on their own. That's what, that's one of the big, uh, big things that I push for. And in the book, I wanted to, again, make it practical. I didn't want to make it very complicated. So uh, I articulate those three simple principles there. One is... Uh, the canonical principle, which is, you know, do one to others as you would, they do one to you. To yourself, yeah. And then second is uh, the categorical principle, which comes from Kantian philosophy. And basically, Immanuel Kant came up with uh, the category, categorical imperative in which he says that in an ethical society, um, you shouldn't do something which if everybody else started doing also mm-hmm. would be detrimental to the society. And you know, mm-hmm. because in the, the canonical principle, you could say, hey, you know what? I steal from people, so I don't mind if they steal from me, <laughs> you know, from time to time, <laughs> right. right? So you could say, you know, I'm keeping it pretty even, but it fails the second principle where, you know, if everybody started stealing, it right. wouldn't be a good society. Right. And uh, then, mm-hmm. of course, the third thing is that, you know, you should do things which uh, meet the sunshine imperative, where if people, if whatever you're doing came out in the papers, then you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be embarrassed by it. So I wanted to keep it simple. Mm-hmm. It's, it's interesting because I was there was another lecture that I was uh, listening to from another uh, uh, gentleman, and he had done a pretty big analysis of ethics and so on, you know, from philosophy and so on. And he had seven different models, you know, going right back to Plato, you know, going all the way to Nietzsche and uh, Spinoza and so on. He had come up mm-hmm. with seven different ethical models that have existed over time. Mm-hmm. 
And then, uh, you know, in the Q&A session, I asked him, like, hey, so what do you think Facebook should do? Because, uh, you know, they're going through this whole struggle yeah. with whether the mm-hmm. platform should be open and people can write whatever it is, even if it's misleading and harmful, or should they try to control that? You know, particularly, we've seen that in politics. And he said, oh, that's a very complex issue. So, you know, you, but the issue, you don't want to have seven different models and not be able to apply it to the situation that you're dealing mm-hmm. with. Whereas if you look at these three simple rules, you know, the first rule is at Facebook, should you be, you know, allowing your platform to be used by people that are trying to harm the country and, you know, put uh, factual, factually mm-hmm. inaccurate information to damage the country? Then, you know, would you, would you want somebody to do that to you? Or you say, hey, mm-hmm. if everybody, if all the other platforms also started doing that same thing, this is the categorical imperative. Would right. that be a detrimental <laughs> thing for the society? And answer is yes, right? So, I mean, you apply mm-hmm. those simple principles. And then, yeah, if this thing all came out in the newspapers, would you be happy about it? No. So, I mean, that whole Facebook premise of sort of keeping the platform open where people can put detrimental stuff, which can mm-hmm. be damaging to uh, young women, which can be damaging to mm-hmm. uh, the politics of the country and the, fr- the freedoms that we enjoy. It fails the test on all those three things. And so as a marketer, you would self-regulate. Right. Kind of what what mm-hmm. I would hope. Uh, but, you know, sometimes marketers don't do that in time. And then the government steps in and tells them mm-hmm. what to do. Yeah, I, like GDPR and Castle and all yeah. the anti-spam legislation. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think that's sort of evidence of yeah, that. Yeah, you're right? asking for it. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. So that's what it is. Yeah. I was, yeah, that's funny. At <laughs> first, when you were asked, great question, V, and a great answer to Cindy. <laughs> I was like, really? Ethics and marketing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> Just as a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it is an important part because, yeah. like, the other thought that, uh, you know, the, I think it was in, um, oh, what's his name? Dan Rally's book, I think it was. He was talking about um, behavioral science and how you can – change opt-in rates for things by simply making people opt out right. and so one of the examples was like organ donors right. in like countries around uh, yes, europe yes. and so they were saying well there's this one country i forgot which one it was but it's something like netherlands had 90 percent opt-in right. rates for organ donors and everyone else was like five or ten percent right, right right and when they went and figured out why they're like oh because they have to opt out rather than opt in and so <laughs> it was just one of those little tricks of the mind where you're like oh, it's i don't know i'll, leave, I'll yeah. leave it but you could you can manipulate people versus nudging people right. and i think that's an interesting those are great rules right, right. to help figure out what is a nudge versus what is manipulation what is manipulation versus what's positive and i think the, uh, you know in the same opt-in opt-out thing sometimes like there's you have statements which are more what i call confirm shaming which is like mm-hmm. do you really want to never ever have such wonderful knowledge from Sandeep, they all come to you again, you know, or something like that, you know. So there you're trying mm-hmm. to shame the person into staying opted in right. versus respecting their wish mm-hmm. that they want to opt out of your newsletter, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, so there are all these things which are called dark patterns with the University of Chicago identified in online marketing, which are these little nudges which are being used in a negative way mm-hmm. to make people mm-hmm. do things that they don't want to do. Right. And mm-hmm. that is what is unethical, clearly. But, mm-hmm. you know, they found thousands of instances of things like that on the web where websites sure. are doing things which are using these uh, techniques, uh, which they've cataloged, and right. they call them dark patterns. Yeah. Uh, they're used by the thousands. People are doing it, and they yeah. should. Yeah. Sandeep, this has been incredible. First of all, you've given us obviously a lot of information to to, to digest, and yeah. we really appreciate the time. Uh, could you mind sharing with our, with our listeners how can they find out more about you? Yes, certainly. So you can uh, go to my website, which is called sandeepdayal.com. Mm-hmm. and from time to time, I do my blog there. You can sign up for my email, in which case you might start receiving my newsletter as well. And this is what the book looks like. I love the title, by the way. The years. Love the time. And, mm-hmm. uh, certainly, it's uh, available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and everywhere online. Fantastic! Awesome! Thanks so much, Sandeep. It was really awesome chatting with you. I really appreciate your insights and thoughtful put into the book and uh, 
I've shared with us here. Thanks. I enjoyed it. It was easy talking to you guys. So thank you for the time. No problem. We appreciate it. Time for the post pod discussion with Mark and V. V. Post pod. Oh, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I love the post pad introductions. They're always like off the cuff. Uh, it's fun. It makes it, it sparks joy in my life. Uh, we keep uh, saying this after everyone, so Sin, but like, what a great guest, first of all. And I love a lot yeah. of the stuff that he's talking about in the book. Yeah. I, I, and I said this out loud. I was really struggling reading through some of the book and trying to, reconcile the stuff that he's talking yeah. about with some of the stuff we've talked about and then other things that I've been learning about. Um, but I really enjoy the conversation with them. I felt like it, like a lot of the pieces started fitting together and calling some things differently than how I maybe am yeah, used yeah, to yeah. it, but the meaning and the, in, and the intention behind it, I think is so good. I really thought the question about ethics at the end was amazing, by the way. Um, and, and his, his response was incredible. Yeah. So, like, I do think that's a genuine thing that we probably should think more about as as a group of professionals. I agree. Um, I yeah. agree. And you know what? It's it's when I was going through the book and I came up to the chapter on ethics. Immediately, I'm like, hmm, okay, this will be interesting. Touchy feely, yeah, right? <laughs> but like, when you get into it, it's like, you know what? The responsibility we bear as marketers. It's quite intense. Mm -hmm. And I think if we don't recognize that, we mm -hmm. may fall into this idea of like, as long as I'm getting the numbers, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And I think we, yeah. I think we should hold ourselves to a higher standard. Yeah. Well, in, and mm -hmm. on that note, thinking about associations right. and network, associative networks, mm -hmm. when you said holding ourselves to a higher standard, it made me think of purpose. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I was really struggling with. That was a good push. Even at, well, thanks. But even at that, um, the purpose thing, like I've heard people talk about this before, and I think we'll probably talk about this more with other guests. Like it should be enough that like if you sell white shirts, that your purpose is to white sell shirts. a white shirt. You don't need like an incredible, uh, I don't know, we're saving the world with every t-shirt made kind of yeah. thing. Like Tentry does yeah. that. Just make a great fucking white totally. shirt that fits the people that want to buy yeah. it really well. And, and like, that can be enough. You know what I mean? Like, surprisingly, that's hard to do. You know, it, we, we talked about it <clears throat> with him, but honestly, in our, in our, our shared experience that, you know, um, you know, years ago now, but it was such a aha uh -huh moment when they said, just be, embrace the notion that you're a retailer and that you're a big box retailer. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. No, don't be ashamed don't be of ashamed that. Don't be ashamed of it. And I think, like at that time, like, like this aspiration that we had, and I'm not saying it's wrong to have an aspiration, but I think it's almost like understanding the context that you're trying to build that aspiration. It may not mm -hmm. fit. Mm -hmm. Stay true to who you are. Yeah. I, I yeah, and I, I kind of what I liked about where we ended up with that conversation is the idea that purpose can be a strategic uh advantage yep. if if you embed it in into the core of of what you're doing exactly and if you don't then don't like that's fine like you don't need it to compete but if you feel like it's a an advantage then then compete with it don't just like you know throw some fluff up and say oh yeah this is you know purpose <laughs> i check the box just yeah Honestly, yeah. like I, you brought up the example around McDonald's where you just, you know, you're going through the drive through so to speak, and you just want consistency. And while you were speaking to it in, as another, in another context, when I think about is, does McDonald's have a purpose, like outside of delivering fast food on time, on budget, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. I don't know anything else that their brand stands for. All I know is I can get my Big Mac there and that's enough for me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I also yeah. thought what was interesting is like when he, when he, um, the way he kind of like talked about the, the brand vibes, the brand sense. And what was the third one? Give me a sec here. Re um, 
I was going to say relevance. Um, mm, resolve, brand resolve. Re resolve. Right? And I thought, you know, and I know you challenged him a little bit on that as well in terms of like, and you correlated to some other, I don't remember uh, what you correlated to. Oh, like trust, consumer trust, consumer. Engagement? No, did you have uh, engagement in there? Yeah, I drawn a blank on that. It was it was in the notes. It was in the notes. <laughs> but you know, I, what, what I did appreciate about that is like, it's it's easy to kind of wrap your head around. It's like, okay, with the brand vibes, what, what is that brand? What is it eliciting, right? The, the mm -hmm. sense, what is that sense of that brand that, that you're engaging with or you have as a consumer? And then what does that resolve? So I think he's, what he's done, what, what he's been able to achieve in this book is a real way of kind of thinking about branding as it translates into the cognitive side of things. So how does the brain work? And I thought he also did an incredible mm -hmm. job really kind of articulating like the list branding, the layer branding, and you know the fact that I have literally a to-do list right next to me that I need to tackle. And yeah, like how often do you go to the grocery store? You don't remember everything on that list, mm -hmm. even if it's written down. Yeah, totally. So yeah. how is that working I mean, for marketing, really? I don't know. Well, yeah, and it kind of goes back to the, the beginning of the conversation, which was, you know, thinking about how starting with empathy and and um, and I, I don't mean empathy again in a touchy feely way. I mean, like fucking sit with people and talk get to, to them. them and get to know what the end users are yeah. doing. And like at some point, we're going to have to have Fred on the show. But <laughs> we should. <laughs> Fred, if you're listening. <laughs> But um, but that is a thing, like to get with uh, the customer. It's part of market research, and it doesn't have to be you know a big focus group. It can be done one on one. It can be done yeah. just in the field, uh, like ethnographic research, like Jane Goodall studying. I don't mean to say people are like chimpanzees, but but studying totally. you know your customers in the wild, yeah. like that's a totally legitimate kind of research for anybody it doesn't have to be massive surveys and you know really costly focus groups like it can just be done one by one bit by bit you know it can be done that way i, I agree and um and i know we with a lot of guests we kind of get into some of the nuances around you know how do you build the idea of a brand with purpose and and whatnot and i think this is why we struggled with it a little bit because you know we mm -hmm. we have the i guess the antithesis of this like well nobody really cares about what your brand mm -hmm. stands for. Really. If you have a mm -hmm. good product and that's what they, they're, they're buying. Like for example, again, we could talk about McDonald's. I, I'm just, I just want my Big Mac, man. You don't need to tell, tell mm -hmm. sell me this bigger story around purpose. Right. Mm -hmm. But the brands that you really connect with probably have a purpose mm -hmm. aligned to it, you mm -hmm. know? And I think there's not many of them. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so going back to that McDonald's example, this is a real example. We're driving through Fernie yeah. and there's two places, well, two places the kids want to stop and we're, we already stopped and grabbed something mm -hmm. for us. But I think this is where purpose shakes out. My kids have a perception that A&W is healthier because yeah. I think the commercials, commercials say that we're grain fed, organic Grass beef, fed or not even whatever. organic beef, but grass yeah, local farmers, yeah. the potatoes are local, all that kind of, I think that's their perception of, I don't know that it's true. Like they probably have the same number of calories. Like yeah. the, I think McDonald's probably also sources their potatoes from Alberta, yeah. but I think that's how purpose shakes out for a lot of people. There's a, like all of the stuff and all the work and probably the mission statements yeah. and the visions and all that kind of stuff and the purpose and all of that kind of stuff comes out to something simple for a typical consumer that because they don't think about a and w all the time except for when they're hungry and when it's nearby totally because they can like if it's not nearby it's like it's not a choice it's not an yeah. option so what is around and so but that moment there was competition between two places we could stop and i think that was what the choice came down and we didn't want to stop a and w yeah uh, so we won, but, <laughs> but <laughs> we won democracy rules. I wanted to get a coffee. The household. That, that was actually the winning. Yeah. That was the winning vote. Like I wanted to get a coffee too. And McDonald's has better coffee. So that's a fair point. that was the winning that's vote. A fair point. 
it's you know we we obviously didn't get through all the questions we had outlined for for Sandeep, but I think the one thing that really sticks out in in my mind at least <clears throat> is it goes back to the notion as marketers we have a responsibility to make sure that we're challenging everything. So this idea of like how mm -hmm. do you breed in or bring in, sorry stay closer a little bit to the sciences and understand how human behaviors work and how do you align a strategy against that, I mm -hmm. think can really get you to that, you know, that maybe not a silver bullet, so to speak, but what it can do is mm -hmm. it, it should come from the lens of being consumer centric and, you know, be really applying that. And then how do you cr start mm -hmm. creating some of those mind structures? So I love the, we talked about it in our last podcast, like starting to apply more science to our discipline cannot be a bad mm -hmm. thing. And I'm, I'm hearing people already out there probably say, oh, you can't take the emotion out of marketing. And I'm not saying take the emotion out of marketing. What I'm saying is like mm -hmm. apply the science and the rigor that science has to our discipline yeah. so we become better. Yeah. I agree. We've got a couple of really interesting guests coming up and we're going to talk more about that, especially yeah. in the context of creativity. Yeah, yeah, yeah and being more scientific about creativity. So I'm very fascinated by that, but uh, I mean, I'm excited about it, but um, like there's, there's so many like behavioral bias. We should also talk about somebody that can do like some of the behavioral, behavioral biases, bi like, I'm sure write that like down. price anchoring yeah, and yeah, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Like it's fascinating what, how our brains yeah. work. It's just mind blowing. Um, but that would be great. But there's this one David Ogilvy quote that I always think about whenever that argument comes up, which is, Give me the freedom of a tight brief. Hmm. And to me, like the more I can create a box around um, a, a request mm -hmm. helps me think more freely within the request because now I know what I can't right. do. Otherwise, I'm constantly in debate about, well, what if we do this or do this? And, I, you know, and then that creates a lot of turmoil and frustration and I think leads to a subpar product it's like trying to take a photograph right. i used to do photography for a long time you have a frame yeah. and and that frame determines how you're gonna tell the story create the yeah. photo and tell the story and you have to f work within that frame to tell and that's what makes great photographers which i am not <laughs> great photographers because they can do amazing things within the yeah. frame and communicate visually um things very powerful powerful i had never heard that quote before that is a great quote actually yeah that's a good one that makes remember when we were talking about um briefing right and i think like mm -hmm. how it totally. can become the achilles heel of any marketing campaign mm -hmm. i i think it goes back to that like provide that frame that you need for people to be creative in mm -hmm. yeah but yeah. yeah well and, and like a lot of stuff that sandeep was talking <clears throat> about like the more we know about our customers, the better these briefs are going to come. Yeah. And, and then the better the quality the output of the creative and then therefore the effectiveness of the ads and then the profitability right. of the ads and cash register rings, everyone's yeah. happy. No. It... Not that everyone's all about cash registers, but. <laughs> well. But profit matters. Profit matters. <laughs> so matters. Let's talk about... <laughs> I've yet to work for an organization where cash doesn't rule king, but anyways. It's true. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was a really fun conversation. I, I, I really appreciate his point of view on things. Yeah. It was um, somewhat refreshing. Uh, again, I, I like seeing some material in a, in a different context in a different way. And I think at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, like uh, just challenging the way you think. It's mm -hmm. not a bad thing. Even if you get back to what mm -hmm. you already knew, right? That process mm -hmm. is still, I think, very, very important as marketers. We constantly look to reinvent ourselves, constantly look to be better in, in our roles. And mm -hmm. I think it's it's only important. And I think this layer of, a, that, you know, applying an idea of cognitive branding, I think mm -hmm. I'm not even using this as like becoming like a catchphrase or something like, oh, this is the new shiny thing. This is not relatively new. But the methods mm -hmm. and the why behind it is constantly evolving. So I think we owe it mm -hmm. to ourselves to stay close to this science and to this idea um, mm -hmm. because we can become better marketers. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, we, we 
talked about at one point marketers making up marketing language and lingo yeah. and stuff to promote and sell their own things. And I think at the time, um, you know, I, I for sure I'm resistant to it, but I'm okay with like what you're suggesting. And, and what I like about what Sandeep is saying, he's got a different perspective yeah. and his perspective is valid. Totally. I'm trying to pull from it what I can and make it fit with how I understand yep. things. So whether I use his language or not, really irrelevant, but I learned something yep. from it. And so that's more important for me that I de continue to develop my own totally. perception and, and understanding of how things work. And to your point, you know, at the very least, this is going to be self-correcting because this is built on science and it will eventually self-correct. Even if I'm wrong today, we'll learn. Yep. I'm open to learning and figuring out what the right thing is later. Oh, exactly. If yeah. anything, he we, he said it even during the, the interview, like the things that we're talking about, the things where we're being challenged with are, com are complex in so many different ways. And I think that's also a testament to the discipline that we, that we serve. Mm -hmm. Like it, what we're, the problems we're trying to solve for are not easy. They're complex. When you're talking about human behaviors around the why behind I'm purchasing this over this, A&W over mm -hmm. uh, McDonald's or vice versa, Nike over Adidas, mm -hmm. this is not easy. You can't just come in and become an Adidas. You can't just come in and become a new Nike. Look at, mm -hmm. look at UA. They came in. Yeah, they disrupted the market for a little bit, but they didn't overtake Adidas or Nike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. B, another good this chat. Great. I really, this is, really this is great. We should keep doing this. Yeah, why, why not? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. <laughs> it's great, man. This is good. All right, buddy. Until the next time. Have a good one, man. You too.